Let's uh, go for the for the last uh, session of the of the conference, the uh, fourth uh, session, which uh, deals uh, with the monetary fiscal interactions in the context of a monetary uh, union. We have uh, two two very interesting uh, contributions here. So the first one is going to be presented uh, by Hushin B uh, from the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, Kansas City, who is going to present uh, the paper asset purchases in a monetary union with default and uh, liquidity mm -hmm. risks which is joint work uh, with Andrew Forrester and uh, Nora Trump. So, Hushin, the floor is yours. You have uh, 25 minutes. Great. Thank you so much for having the paper in this wonderful conference. Um, so this paper is, as I said, joined with Andrew and Nora. And we talk about asset purchase in the monetary union model with both default and the liquidity risk. So usual disclaimer apply here. So this paper is motivated very much by the policy discussions and the policy actions taken uh, at the ECB. Um, as the members of executive board have been discussing, the financial market fragmentation can impair the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. Um, and this is particularly relevant for the euro area when you have different countries have different fundamentals and different institutions. So ECB has asset purchase programs to address the market fragmentation driven by different type of risk, default risk, liquidity risk. For instance, the OMT uh, rolled out during the height of the financial crisis, uh, the debt crisis, and the TPI rolled out last year as uh, the ECB raised interest rate. So what do we, uh, the question we are gonna focus in this paper is specifically how do default risk when it interact with liquidity risk, impact the economy, and how useful asset purchases to, in, uh, to counter them. So to answer that question, we're gonna build the two country monetary union model features both type of risk. And we're gonna specifically look at uh, one um, type of transmission at the moment is that when you have deteriorations in the macro fundamentals, that's gonna drive up the default risk and then that can spill over to have a liquidity risk through the financial market uh, uh, conditions. So what do we find is that through the lens of this model, we find that both type of risk can dampen the economic condition following the increase in government debt. But the magnifying effect from the liquidity risk is far more consequential and therefore making the asset purchase market more effective in the presence of liquidity risk. So let me dive into details with the model. It's a two country model. In the home country, the government sets tax and government expenditures, and they can issue debt. Now there is default risk in the sense is that the government could default and the default probability. So you can think about there is two regions, default or no default. And then the default probability follows the endogenous region switching process here in the sense that the default probability um, it's not exogenous. It depends on the state of the economy, depends on the debt of GDP ratio. The higher the debt is, the higher the likelihood of default is. And then there is financial intermediary, which we follow the Gutter and Karate set up. The household will deposit at the banks, and then the financial intermediaries would collect the deposit uh, to buy the, home government, the debt from home government as well as the firms. There is a liquidity risk in these channels that the tightness of the credit constraint can vary with default probability. Pro, pro, uh, default probability. I'm gonna explain more um, as I dive into the details. At the moment, the foreign countries are abstract from those segmented financial market. So there is no financial intermediaries as a standard model that the household would directly invest in the private firms and they also directly hold the government bond. There is a union-wide monetary policy. There is Taylor rule, um, and they, uh, the, the, the monetary policy could also purchase the government bond, and it's gonna follow some type of rule as the financial conditions tightened, that's gonna trigger the asset purchase in this uh, framework. So this is another way to visualize how the model looks at the moment. In the home uh, countries, you have a household, flow the deposit to the banks, and the banks would purchase private debt as well as public debt. In the foreign uh, sectors, it's simpler, and the household directly uh, invest and also hold the government bond. There is um, capital flow between the two countries, so there is a common deposit rate uh, in this monetary union. 
Now, let me start with the home government. Uh, the government collect the tax, lump sum tax, as well as distortion tax, income tax, and the consumption tax to um, finance government spending. They also issue long-term government bond. So the kappa B here is a decay, you can think about this coupon that's decaying over time to capture is a long-term government debt. Um, and here we are going to assume that lump sum tax is going to respond to the change of government debt. This is a simplifying assumption that just to say we're going to have allow the least distortion tax to respond to the debt uh, dynamics. We could use like uh, the similar rules distor distortion tax. It does not change the result much. Importantly, the government can default on the bonds and by take a haircut. So there are two regimes here. They can default, take a haircut of delta B or no default. And the default probability follows here is we take a logistic function, and you can think it's some kind of function form of the debt of GDP ratio and as well as the macro conditions of the economy. So let me visualize that here. So the blue line shows, um, you know, in the baseline case, as debt of GDP ratio goes up, the default probability goes up. And the shift of the, to the red line means that the deterioration of the macro fundamentals could shift your default probabilities. Therefore, the same level of debt that in the more um, deterioration, the macro fundamentals could face a higher default probabilities. So um, we don't explicitly model the decisions of when they default, uh, but you can interpret this, the similar dynamics could arise in the model that you take those strategic decisions on board. This is simply to capture that the default probability is not exogenous. It depends on the fundamentals in uh, some kind of systematic way. And the banks who hold those down the bond understand that. And uh, for other firms here, the wholesale firms, they, um, they issue long-term private bond to finance private investment. So this is not the friction in the model, is that in the standard model, the householder would be directly invest in the firms. Here, the firms have to issue a share of their, uh, have to issue bond, which is on the right-hand side here, showing the net flow of long-term bond. Have, they have to issue this bond to finance eta i share of the investment. Um, and they use the investment, the capital, as well as the label to produce, that's standard. And we also have a home investment producer here. They assemble investment with adjustment cost. And in the uh, simulation, I'm going to use that in the sense, you know, if you consider there is a demand shock, how that demand shock could shift, uh, characterize that as a deterioration in the macro fundamentals, how that's going to give rise to the uh, default probability. The household here, they uh, deposit in the domestic financial intermediaries. They also hold the one period cross region asset that is, so that you have the uh, union wide deposit rate that is the same across two countries. And then we have the financial intermediaries. Um, so first they face a balance sheet constraint in the sense is that at every period, they're gonna collect the deposit DT from the household. And then they're gonna purchase government and private debt BT and FT, and at their market value, and then they can also accumulate the net worth. So the net worth is going to depend on the realized return on holding those assets. So when the government is going to default and take a haircut, that's going to reflect in the net worth of the bank, and that's going to have implication for the bank dynamics here. Um, and then they face a uh, um, maximized problem here that um, they're going to maximize the expected net worth throughout their lifetime. And if there is no survival rate, then what's going to happen is that they're going to accumulate enough as uh, net worth. They don't need to uh, rely on the deposit. So if we follow the literature that assuming those firms, uh, those banks have a survival rate of sigma. And therefore, uh, with this, with a one minus sigma, they may exit from the uh, banking sector and take the net worth with them. And uh, um, we also assume there is an incentive constraint here in the sense that the banks can divert an ETA V share of their asset 
Therefore, that gives rise to the financial frictions here in those models. That because they can divert a share of the asset, so they have an incentive constraint. The value has to be higher than whatever the asset they can divert, otherwise the, the household will not deposit at the banks. Um, and here we are gonna have introduced a liquidity channel. So the ETA V is a share of the asset they can divert. It's gonna vary with the default risk. And the higher the default risk, the ETA V is gonna go up, means the higher share of the asset they're gonna divert, they, the binding constraint is becoming more binding. So intuition here is that um, if you think an extreme case that the incentive constraint is only occasionally binding, so what's gonna happen is that when you expect there's gonna be a haircut in the future, your asset is gonna decline, uh, the net worth from the bank is gonna decline, and the leverage is gonna go up. Therefore, the constraint would be becoming binding, from not binding to becoming binding. So here we're not explicitly modeling the occasional binding constraint, we introduce these uh, liquidity channels to capture that, um, the dynamics in essence. Um, so here at the bottom, we have the first order condition for the bonds. So compare, so for instance, the lambda V here measures the, is, is a Lagrange multiplier associated with the incentive constraint. And the return on asset, the difference between the return on the asset and the deposit rate is the excess return. So if the constraint is not binding, this is, would be standard. There is no excess return. In this model with the financial friction, the lambda V is positive, and therefore the excess return is gonna depending on the, how tight your, your, your incentive constraint is. The tighter the constraint is, the bank is gonna ask more higher excess return uh, for that uh, asset. And those is adjusted for the leverage and adjusted discount factor from the bank's perspective. Okay, uh, for the foreign economy, um, it, we abstract from segmented financial market for now. There is no banks, so therefore there is no default or liquidity risk as well. Householder hold government bonds, hold their own government bonds, and invest in private firms directly. The monetary policy at the union wide, in the background, there is a standard Taylor rule. They uh, follow the deviation for the inflation and output that is weighted across the union. Uh, importantly, we introduce unconventional policy of asset purchase, that BCB. So this is showing that um, at each period that the uh, monetary policy, the, 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 the central bank, can go on the market to purchase the government debt. And the T cap, uh, the cap T here is whatever uh, is either deferred asset as what happens now or the um, you know the, the profit you make, um, and that you know it's um, at the at the at the union level, and we assume that asset purchase is triggered by follow some kind of rule here that it depends on the excess return. So because excess return measures the financial constraint or how tight the, the, the um, financial market is, conditions is, the higher that spread, then the larger the uh, asset purchase is. So to capture that um, in, in the, in the uh, frame mechanism in the, in the rule perspective. So that is basically our model. And then now, um, oh, one more thing here. The solution, so because we have two regions here, you have a default, it's gonna take a haircut, the government, and then there is no, when there's no default, the haircut is zero. And there is some kind of probability the transition between the two regimes. And we also have a liquidity channels, as I just explained, the ETA V will de also depends on your default probability. So uh, we solve this, we cannot solve the model by linearization. So instead, we use uh, the method by developed by Andrew and his co-authors. So those specific uh, method would be geared towards solving those region switch model that allowed the endogenous uh, region switch in the sense that the default, the, the transition probability is not exogenous. All right, let me go to the result here. So the question we're interested in is how do default risk when interact with the liquidity risk impact the economy? And how does each channel contribute that impact? And also how effective asset purchase? 
So we're going to uh, start with a simpler case to say there is increase in government uh, debt, therefore the default probability goes up, and uh, explain the transmission mechanism. And then uh, I'm going to show you a uh, case that is kind of saying, oh, there is a negative demand shock that leads to increase government debt. So it's one step further. But the, the underlying transmission mechanism flow through the, the, the same way as a simpler case here. So in the similar case here, let, let's just think that there is a case come the debt increase by close to uh, above 14 percent. And in this case, when debt increase, the government bond price declines. You know, you have a higher supply, the government bond price declines. And then from bank's perspective, that tightens the ba uh, balance budget, uh, the, 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 the constraint. Um, therefore, the private bond price also has declined. Basically, they would have to sell the private bond to balance the, the to absorb the high government debt. And in this case, you have the net worth is lower from the lower uh, asset prices and the leverage is higher. And uh, it's, it's also drive up the excess return on the government bond. So basically, within the higher leverage, within the higher net, uh, lower net worth, what happens is a bank would ask for a high X return on their asset um, in these heightened financial conditions. Um, and of course, there are two extra channels that strengthening that, that dynamics here, one's default probability, which it shows that at the bottom uh, right here, as the data goes up, the default probability goes up. So when the default probability goes up, the banks expect that they may take a haircut in the future that can can further uh, contribute to tightening conditions here. And also there is extra liquidity risk here, the, the channel, when the default probability goes up, um, the lambda, uh, the eta V also goes up. So the constraint or, uh, that banks facing are even tighter because of the default probability. So there is a baseline in fact, there is default uh, channels, and then there is liquidity channels. And I'm going to decompose that in a minute. Before I do that, let me show you the impact on the real side. So the blue line shows the home economy, and the dashed is showing the foreign uh, countries here. Because the banks has in the tightened financial conditions, they sell the private bond, actually. Um, then the investment declines, take a, a pretty sharp declines here. Uh, seven percent, and that leads to a low output, and uh, also because from the household perspective, that they have a lower deposit in the um, in the banks, and their consumption could increase temporarily, but over time, because of lower output, the consumption also turns negative. Um, importantly, inflation for the home country in this case is increased because with tightened financial conditions, it raised the financing cost for the firms, and that's inflationary. From the foreign countries, on the other hand, because there is a capital outflow from the home country to the foreign countries, therefore the investment is actually increased in the foreign countries, and output goes up, consumption goes up. And that also has inflation goes up because that's more like a demand driven. So even though the inflation increase in both countries, the underlying, um, the underlying reason is different. One is from the supply side, one is from the demand side. Now let me decompose um, how the impact on the financial sectors, what is contributing to the uh, default risk, what is to the liquidity risk. So we hear that um, the blue line here shows the difference between the baseline case, which is what I just showed you, against the case, there is no default risk, there is no liquidity risk. So you wanna think the, the, the blue line is basically, what is the default channel and the liquidity channel together contribute to the overall impact? And you can see here that in this case, the both channels lead to higher debt and the lower government uh, prices. And also, they have a much lower net worth, therefore investment is lower, output is lower, excess return is higher, as the blue line shows here, and the inflation is also higher. 
Now, interestingly, that the red line is showing what is contributed by the default risk per se. And so you want to think about the, the red line is the difference between the case you have the default risk channel, but you don't have the liquidity channel. And against the, a case, there is no default, no liquidity. So that is just the red line just saying, if you only have a default, you don't trigger the EWV, that, that uh, channels, what the impact from that per se. And you see that it's qualitatively similar, but quantitatively is much smaller, that the debt is, in, is higher, but the um, gum the bond price did decline, but to much less extent, and the net worth is, um, is, is declined, but also to much extent, much less extent. So this is really highlight that even though both the channels could dampen economic conditions, but the really big impact is coming from the liquidity uh, channels from, from the banking sector. Okay, so then what we do here is that we say, now we introduce the asset purchase in the presence of a two type of risk. And we say uh, how much the asset purchase could contribute, like depends on which channels you have. Again, the blue lines you want to think about how much a big impact the asset purchase could have if you have both channels at, in presence versus the red line here is showing you only have a default channels. So again, the asset purchase showed in the middle column here that um, the magnitude is would be different because it depends on the excess return on the government bond. And as I show you here that when you have both channels, the excess return is much stronger when you have both channels. Therefore, the asset purchase quantity is a bit different. And uh, um, so you see that with both channels at play, the asset purchase could really benefit, could uh, uh, improve the out output uh, overall economy as net worth is higher. It's that, of course, is boosting the government bond price. Therefore, it's improved the balance sheet for the banks that they did not have to sell as much private bond, it increased, it's it relative to the baseline case, it did, um, contains the scope, the investment has to decline, and also contain the scope, the output has to decline. Um, and on the other hand, when you only have a default uh, risk channel here, the asset purchase is, it triggers smaller and that impact is smaller. But it's really because the impact from the liquidity risk is much stronger than the default risk per se in this model. Okay, so before I go to the next exercise, let me quickly summarize here is that, as I said, both default and the liquidity risk can dampen economic conditions here. When you have increased government debt, you have a high default risk. But the impact from liquidity risk is far more consequential. Therefore, the asset purchase uh, becomes more effective in this case. Now, we want to consider a negative demand shock to the home country. So you think uh, here we can see the negative investment uh, efficiency shock, but it could be other shocks. That just lead to a deterioration in the economic conditions. And then therefore, the government debt is increased and the, the default probably goes up. It also shifts the distribution uh, that therefore, the, even for the same level of debt, your default probability could be higher. So those both channels is going to increase the default probability, and uh, also could have the tightening liquidity channels if that is in present. Okay, so let me quickly go through this. You know, it's a it's a quantitative could be different, but the qualitative is really as similar as what I just showed you, right? Um, you you have uh, when. This is again is a difference between the blue line is showing when you have both channels in presence, you know, how much both channels can contribute to the economy uh, versus you don't have either channel. And uh, the debt is going to be higher, come the debt price is lower, and uh, um, investment is lower versus you have only have default channels that is much more contained, the scope. And again, the asset purchase, similar as a simpler case that the asset purchase is more powerful. He has much bigger impact when you have both channels in place. So let me conclude. So at the moment, what we have is we're showing that um, when you're having a case that the default risk leads to a liquidity risk, 
And we show the magnifying effect from this liquidity risk really appears to be far more consequential and therefore asset purchase, it seems more effective. So next step, what we would like to do uh, is that introduce a financial intermediary to the foreign country block. Therefore, we could explore more about the cross-country spillover through the financial channel. At the moment, we only have the trade channels. Um, and you potentially could ask a question is that, what if you have a union-wide liquidity shock, how that affect countries with a weak macro fundamentals? So with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hushin, also for adjusting uh, so well to the time slot. So the discussion, uh, the discussion is going to be provided by uh, Anna Rogantini Pico from the ECB. Anna, you have uh, 15 minutes. Thanks a lot uh, for uh, letting me participate in this uh, great conference and discussing Hooks in papers. Um, so let me start uh, first putting the paper into the euro area context. Um, prompted by crisis of various nature, uh, the ECB has uh, put in place a variety of policy tools uh, involving so sovereign bond purchases. Um, in 2012, at the peak of the sovereign debt crisis, it um, uh, announced the outright monetary transaction. Um, in 2020, to address uh, the pandemic emergency, the pandemic emergency purchase program was uh, set up, uh, announced and implemented right away. Uh, and just uh, a year ago, in 2022, the transmission protection instrument uh, was announced uh, to address uh, fragmentation uh, risks and help the transmission of monetary policy. Um, well, some of these um, um, policy tools have been activated, like the uh, PEP. Others have only been announced, uh, and this has been uh, enough to uh, calm things down, like the, the OMT, for example. But um, in all cases, the big challenge uh, for, uh, for policymakers is really to understand how uh, two risks, um, the sovereign risk and the liquidity risk, uh, which are at play uh, together, how they interact and they reinforce each other. Um, and uh, when we have a better understanding of this, of course, how this asset purchase is done by a central bank can facilitate uh, a smooth transmission of monetary policy when the two risks are at play. So this paper really is an extremely timely contribution to the policy debate on how to think about uh, sovereign and liquidity risk and their interaction. So the paper in a nutshell, um, uh, uh, so, so the big contribution is to jointly uh, model uh, default and liquidity risk in a two country monetary union uh, set up. And in particular, default risk is uh, uh, endogenous in the in a regime switching process that depends on uh, debt to GDP and on macro fundamentals. And uh, the second important ingredient is liquidity risk, and uh, that stems from uh, financial uh, market fragment segmentation, uh, meaning that households can't uh, directly um, uh, buy bonds, but they have to do that via intermediaries, which are uh, constrained. And so that generates a, a friction uh, uh, with this amplification channel. Uh, so once uh, once the the model is set up with these features, then uh, what uh, Huxin has shown us is uh, a quantitative assess, uh, assessment of the relative importance of these two channels in response to an uh, exogenous rise in government debt. And um, uh, in particular, uh, the direct effect of sovereign risk uh, turns out to be moderate. But uh, what is really um, uh, quantitatively more significant is the amplification coming from, uh, from a liquidity risk uh, channel. Um, so uh, given, given these two uh, channels at play, uh, if we want to evaluate um, uh, the effects of sovereign uh, debt purchases done by uh, the central bank, uh, because the, the stronger uh, amplification comes from the liquidity risk, um, then it turns out that the, the, that the asset purchases are most uh, effective in, in dampening precisely uh, this channel. And so they're more stabilizing when there is uh, liquidity risk, which amplifies uh, uh, sovereign risk. Uh, 
um, it, uh, government purchases would be uh, effective also in absence of, of, of this amplification effect, but the effect would be uh, uh, less strong. So, um, uh, the plan of the discussion is first to zoom in uh, the main ingredients, uh, the sovereign risk and liquidity risk, and then um, thinking about whether this is really a model for OMT or TPI, um, which direction of propagation we, we should uh, ex uh, think about and explore, and thirdly, uh, on the spillover effects uh, across countries. Okay, let me uh, start from uh, endogenous default risk. This, is, uh, uh, this happens in the home country. Remember, this is a two-country uh, setup, uh, but um, a sovereign, uh, sovereign risk only happens in home country. Um, and um, so there is a, a, a haircut uh, that debt to GDP, uh, when debt to GDP ratio uh, goes above a given threshold, B star, um, and uh, it's endogenous because uh, there is a probability that, that the GDP um, is bigger than this threshold, which is uh, uh, dependent on two uh, things. One is uh, macro shocks, and the other is uh, debt to GDP ratio. Um, the second ingredient uh, that is important is this liquidity risk channel. And this is uh, modeled uh, um, uh, adding uh, uh, um, a friction a la Gertrude and Karadi and more recently Sims and Wu. Uh, and here, um, so financial markets are fragmented because as I was saying, uh, households can't directly purchase bonds, but they have to do it via uh, intermediaries. But these intermediaries face an agency problem in the sense that they could run uh, uh, run away with their assets. So there must be an incentive constraints for them not to do this. And so uh, that's the incentive constraints. The value of the intermediary has to be non smaller than a given share of uh, the, the assets that they, they hold. Uh, and this is both private assets and uh, sovereign bonds. And uh, what is important is this ETA, this, this share, uh, that can be thought of as credit tightness. And what uh, is important for the amplification channel uh, is that this eta is going to uh, be a function of the default probability. So this is what connects uh, the sovereign risk to, uh, uh, to credit market tightness. And so in particular, uh, if this uh, parameter uh, phi uh, is zero, there is no amplification effect coming. Uh, so so the, the, the default risk is not gonna uh, make financial markets tighter. But if this channel is at play, then an increase in, in the default probability is gonna tighten uh, the constraint that the financial intermediaries uh, face. All right, so... Um, then, the, the, well, this liquidity risk channel uh, uh, amplifies sovereign default risk uh, a la Boccola uh, 2016. So now to my first comment. Uh, um, is this a model uh, uh, for specifically OMT or TPI? So here I reported like, the description of TPI uh, in the ECB um, statement, and it says that the euro system will be able to make secondary market purchases of securities issued in jurisdictions experiencing a deterioration in financial condition not warranted by country-specific fundamentals. Um, so we all know how hard it is to really identify uh, the cause of the deterioration in financial condition in practice. But um, uh, this can be done in a model. That's, I think, what, why we, we, we have models for, like to fix ideas and think more about how uh, we can uh, decompose the, the, the two. And so I was thinking about uh, the amplification channel uh, that is activated um, um, in response to uh, micro, macro shocks or fiscal shocks. So at the moment, um, what you are, you've shown us is uh, an, an exogenous increase in debt to GDP. It would be this uh, S uh, T minus one here, uh, in the, uh, which is going to uh, increase the probability of default and so tighten uh, the financial markets. Uh, but this, uh, like the, the model at the moment, is kind of uh, silent about what drives this exogenous increase uh, in debt to GDP. Um, it could be driven by fundamentals. 
uh, worsening, but it could, it could also be driven by uh, beliefs uh, that, just, uh, that just, just move. And here uh, I'm thinking about, I don't know, the Calvo model or more specifically to the apply to the Euro area, uh, Corsetti and the dollar 2016. So I was wondering whether uh, if we want to think of your model as a model for TPI, where the central bank can intervene only if this uh, increase in the um, excess return is not warranted by country-specific fundamentals, but it might be belief-driven, well, uh, can really the two um, drivers of uh, this increase in debt to GDP be disentangled? Uh, and if, even, even if we think about OMT, uh, this, the mere announcement of OMT was sufficient uh, to, to actually rule out this belief-driven fluctuation. So uh, I, I think if you want to target your model more specifically to uh, uh, some tools that the ECB has or central banks have, it would be nice to think more about uh, uh, the drivers of this increase in, in debt to GDP. Um, my second comment is on the propagation uh, of the shock. Um, so at the moment, um, you've uh, mainly uh, focused on the amplification going from uh, sovereign risk uh, via this liquidity risk channel through uh, to uh, a tightening in credit markets. But um, uh, of course, it depends a bit on what crisis you have in mind in your, when, when you model. But um, I think your model uh, allows you to also think about the oppo opposite direction of amplification. It's, everything is already there. Um, and if you think of the past crisis, well, uh, you ha we had uh, credit crunches, which actually uh, triggered a sovereign uh, debt crisis. So um, uh, if I think of the ingredients that you already have, this would mean uh, an increase, uh, like a credit tightening that triggers a contraction in the economy. Because you have uh, endogenous default risk, this would uh, uh, lead to a drop in that to GDP ratio, and so it would trigger an increase in default risk, and so you would have this feedback loop. But the trigger would, would start in the financial market and move to the, to the sovereign market then, rather than the other way around. And uh, I, I think because you have this bo bo both channels and both directions of propagation, uh, I think it would be nice to, to look at both directions and not, not only uh, one arrow, let's say. And finally, my third comment is on uh, uh, how you could leverage more the two country setup. But I, I, I saw from your conclusion slide that you are already thinking about this, so I'm very glad. Uh, so at the moment, all this amplification effect going from uh, sovereign risk to, to credit markets, uh, um, you, 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 we would have it also in a closed close economy setup, so you don't really need uh, a two-country model. Um, but I do think that having a two-country model is valuable, especially if we want to think of the euro area and uh, the ECB uh, policy tools. And so, um, so at the moment, the two countries are connected uh, via imports, so consumption and investment baskets are made of domestic and imported goods. Uh, and there is a one-period nominal bond which is traded uh, across uh, countries. Uh, so this allows you to look at the spillovers of uh, an, an increase in the home uh, country default risk to the foreign country. But um, let's now think about uh, the crisis that uh, the euro area uh, had been through. And if we think of the sovereign debt crisis, uh, there was a huge exposure via the banking sector from one country to the other. I'm thinking here of uh, German banks, for example, uh, being exposed to um, Greek sovereign bonds. And so I think uh, in your setup, it would be really nice if you could model these spillovers uh, more directly. Uh, having um, intermediate, having a segmented market also in the foreign country, and having intermediaries in the foreign country directly uh, uh, being exposed to home sovereign bonds. Uh, now you only you can only look at the the, the macro consequences, but you don't have this uh, uh, direct spillover via uh, the financial markets. Mm -hmm. And here, what I'm thinking about would be uh, having, yeah. Uh, like model intermediaries also in the in the in the foreign country as be subject to, to these incentive constraints and having uh, them holding not only 
uh, foreign uh, country uh, bonds, but also home country bonds. Um, so, in conclusion, I think it's a very nice framework that connects uh, sovereign risk uh, to credit tightness and allows you to study the propagation of shocks of, of different nature. Uh, and in particular, it's a model that features endogenous sovereign risk and uh, liquidity risk channels uh, that amplifies uh, sovereign risk. And it, there's a very nice technical contribution as well, because it's challenging to solve these uh, uh, um, regime switching models. And, and you do with the machinery of Andrew, I guess. <laughs> uh, so uh, my, my, my comment is maybe one big comment. It's like now you've built this very nice model that you can use as a laboratory to think a bit more precisely about which crisis you want to model. and. Uh, um, as a consequence of which shock. And in particular, um, I would try to really think whether uh, the increase in data GDP is driven by macro fundamentals or by shifts in, in beliefs, because then the policy tool that can be activated can, can either be activated or not. So it would be nice to, to see what are the differences. And then uh, I would think more whether the crisis originates in the sovereign debt market or in the private credit market, because you can get amplification in uh, both directions. And finally, I would, uh, uh, because uh, because we are thinking about the Euro area, I would try to think harder about the spillovers uh, from one country to the other, also connecting uh, the financial sector more. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you very much, Anna. I would suggest now uh, opening the floor for uh, questions uh, and then uh, probably uh, Hushin, you may want to address also some of the comments made by, by Anna together with other points and questions. So Klaus, Leo, Sujit. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the, for the great presentations and discussion. I would like to take a step back uh, thinking about the overall uh, framework or setting. I mean, your model nicely shows that if there is a fundamental shock, the problem results from the fact that banks hold government bonds, a lot of government bonds, I would suppose, and that these government bonds are not in investment funds or directly held by households. So that uh, means now there is reason for the central bank to, to intervene. Now, if there was better regulation, would, which would reduce the amount of, of bonds banks are allowed to hold from their domestic sovereign to reduce the doom loop risk potential, there was, would be less of a need for QE or, or TPI or OMT to step in into such uh, situations. Now, could, can one think uh, that banks and um, regulators are not ignoring the signal sent by, say, TPI, could it be that banks say, oh, there is somebody who will step in, as you describe in your model, even in a fundamental shock, because it spills over into a liquidity shock, and say, okay, I have less need to uh, de-risk my balance sheet. I have less, less need as a bank or as a regulator to tell the banks that it's perhaps not good to have too many sovereign bonds of their own domestic sovereign on the balance sheet. And if these incentives are created by the central bank, I would wonder how far we are away from this wonderful paper by Fari and Tirol, 2012, which was called a Collective Model Hazard uh, and Bank Bailout, or something like this. Or, yeah, is, is it not exactly what the central bank may induce, what Fari and Tirol have written 10 years ago? Thanks. Um, let me first say, I, I find this paper really very, very interesting and, and helpful also for us to understand better, uh, you know, what, what, what could be done. And, you know, this amplification channel, I find it simply convincing. If it's there, if you not have only default risk, but liquidity risk, Klaus explained maybe that we could discuss why we have reached this point. But if this is strong in the financial system, it makes intuitive sense that central bank purchases will be more effective in mitigating risks. Now, my question is the following. Let's, let's assume for a second there is not this amplifying liquidity risk channel, just default risk. I mean, how do we have to model, to design central bank? purchases of debt, that not unintentionally we may make uh, default even uh, 
even more likely. And there are, you know, there are very simple point, for example, are the bonds bought by the central bank senior or perceived as being senior, this can make a residual debt held by private investors more risky. This by simply through a, a poor design could, could destabilize the system. In a monetary union, there are these important aspects of risk sharing versus non-risk sharing. Do we create free riding incentives to default on taxpayers from other countries or not? So all these things, I think for this, you need to have a different setup, but, uh, but they, they would matter, so to speak, uh, to, to understand how we address the underlying problem. And then on top of this comes the channel, which you so nicely uh, describe. Oh, sorry, Sujit, uh, you may want to address uh, these points, uh, Hussein, and then we take a second round of uh, questions. Sure. Fine for you. Yeah, thank you. Let me, let me start with Leo's question. Um, so, yeah, that's an important question is that how does asset purchase will change the bank's incentive um, in terms of, you know, it's related to cross question about, you know, whether they should even purchase or have in those risky government bonds. It's a little bit out of scope of this paper because um, we are taking as, you know, the default, of course, the probability is endogenous, but we don't model that incentive, right? In a sense, is to really address your questions, you have to model um, when would like they going to default. And uh, in reality, of course, there is a willingness or to, to, to pay back a debt. There's also political factors there. And uh, I'm very sympathetic to, to, to your point. But it's a little bit out of scope of this question, and we we acknowledge that. Uh, and going back to the first question, is that the regulation? Um, so that's going to be like ultimately you say what's the optimal determination? Like who should hold those? Taking taking, let's assume that the government debt, those common debt, is risky. Who should hold those debt? Right. So it's again it's a little bit out of scope of this model because you know like regardless, you can think about the framework, right? Not just all banks holding it. Like a household could hold in some of the, the, the bonds, but then you need to introduce some kind of friction in the sense that, you know, when they um, intermediate in those bond market, they maybe have some not as efficient as a bank. So therefore, there's some adjustment cost that can be done. But again, when those uh, household they have um, has a haircut, there is consequence as well. Right. So in terms of that the model perspective, that's not going to change a whole lot of who is holding that. But I think it is an important question is that ultimately who should hold those risky debt if you're assuming that it is risky. And uh, um, there's no, maybe the best answer is to, to make it less risky, but that's of course, it's, it's another question or itself. Going back to Anna's point, I think I very much agree with, uh, with all your discussion. Thank you again uh, for those comments. And probably as you can see that the, the, the paper is somewhat not uh, entirely complete, that we build this infrastructure, right, that can do more. At the moment, we really focus on how the default risk is going to channel to the liquidity risk and then the response from the, the central bank. But we, that's why I was saying the end is that we could have the foreign economy also have the banking sector and then they really build that the interaction between the financial friction, financial sectors, and to address that, you know, you could say how the liquidity risk affected the default and how, um, you know, how to leverage these two countries set up at the moment is, is a little bit, I, I mean, I have to say that the fact that you have two countries, right? So when the domestic financial condition tightens, you have capital outflow. So there is some level of those impact that kind of Further constrain the domestic if you think about it compared to the closed economy, but for, for sure it's not fully leveraged the, the framework, and that's something we tend to do uh, as an extra step. So we have three minutes uh, for three questions, starting from the right, Sujit, uh, Victor, and then two from the left. So uh, please try to be concise. Thanks very much. It's a similar to a starting point of Klaus, but what if you just tightened liquidity regulation in the model? Would that not reduce the need to have asset purchases. Thanks. Yeah, and I would like to follow up a bit on the comments by Anna. Uh, and this, uh, I'm wondering whether the relative importance of the default risk relative to the liquidity risk could be affected in a situation where we have a sudden stop that uh, suddenly increases the default risk of a country for a given level of debt. Yeah, also uh, leveraging on Anna's discussion. Um, 
To what extent does the introduction of asset purchases reduce the probability of switching to the, if you want, bad equilibrium? Because in a sense, what you show us is you need very aggressive asset purchases to intervene once a shock occurs. But in a sense, the, what Anna also mentioned, uh, the specificity of OMT and TPI is it's introduced and in a sense it, it provides an insurance and if it's credible, it may never need to be activated. And, and so to what extent can you capture some of this by, for example, reducing the adverse liquidity effects of a shock occurring because something is in place, but it may not need to be used. The second comment relates more to the instrument choice of the central bank, because given that liquidity risk is so prominent, you could think of liquidity providing facilities like the FED's uh, BTFP, you know, where you lend against uh, collateral without haircuts at par value. And so in that sense, you would shield the, at least the banking sector. And that relates maybe to comments by others depends a lot whether in your model you have one type of financial intermediary and let's call it a bank but if you have non-banks then of course you would have a difference between uh, asset purchases and liquidity providing operations so Shin, as you know i'm a great fan of this uh, uh, research of yours a question that perhaps you will want to consider at some point if you have not done it already is how precious it is to have in the financial system an asset that can truly be regarded as safe and compare the overall performance of the model with such a financial system with one in which uh, sovereign debt is indeed full of default risk. Great. Thank you so much for the questions. And it definitely provides a lot of uh, food for thought, and we further explore those framework. Um, so there seems to be some questions. So let me start with a sudden stop. Yes. So um, do I think the relative, like, small impact for default risk in this model is that it's already assuming, in, in a sense, if the banking constraint is already binding, the extra impact from that potential haircut is small. But you're absolutely right. If you have a co occasional binding consent from financial intermediaries, you as you know, it's captured by the ETA V, right? So you want to think of ETA V, why is it so powerful? It's because it captures how you could make in the constraint much binding. Therefore, that impact, we, we're really trying to highlight that is why the impact is so big. Um, but if but once the constraint is binding, the extra impact from the potential haircut is fairly small. So that's kind of what we, we show in the model. Um, and then for the um, Richard's point of asset, yeah, so if we're gonna have like um, cross-country asset uh, holding, like the banks could hold in German bonds, then we could have that, we could address that, that we could compare how, to our baseline case, how that uh, impact. And then to Christopher's points about, you know, the announcement effect, yes. To address that, we would ne really need to take a word Anna was saying that you have like some belief driven, not a fundamental driven, right? You have some, even there is no deteriorations in the um, necessary in the macro conditions, or but there is some beliefs about driven. So therefore the announcement could have a, a big impact on that. We could probably could think about that's some of that a news news uh, shock, you know, like okay, you have announced something's gonna happen, could it potentially happen in the future, and to see how those news effects affect the dynamics. We have not done that yet, but that that's a good point. And the liquidity uh, providing, yes, that would be. I guess I don't know whether in this framework necessarily gonna impact is gonna be different, even though you know so. BTFP, you have collateral, you know, you can basically get the money from the Fed using the collateral as without a haircut. Um, instead of saying you're going to purchase the asset that's going to boost the asset price, therefore you are in the, the bank in a better position with the asset. Quantitatively, I'm not sure whether it's going to be different, but that's certainly something we could try, you know, to, to explore in a sense different uh, programs, how that affect the impact. Um, and the tightening, the, the different liquidity constraints, or, you know, like different uh, regulations in the, in the banks. Um, 
that would be um, so. So the incentive constraint in the banks, you know, some people would in interpretize that as a bank regulations. So you could think about it, you could probably um, have something similar to say, okay, what if you're going to penalize the asset that has haircut versus um, in terms of the regulation versus if you have a safe asset, you don't penalize that. That's something we could explore as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Huixin and Anna, for the very, very uh, good uh, presentation and discussion. So next uh, on the list is uh, Francesco Bianchi from uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University, who is going to present uh, the paper Fiscal Influences on Inflation in OECD Countries 2020-2022, which is joint work uh, with uh, Robert Barrow. So, Francesco, the floor is yours. First of all, thank you for having me. And given that I'm the last speaker of the day, let me take this opportunity to thank uh, the organizers for this great conference. Um, so this is a joint work with uh, uh, Robert Barrow. Uh, and uh, what we are interested in, in, uh, in doing in this paper is to understand the cross-sectional uh, inflation episodes in the post-COVID period through the lens of the fiscal theory price level. So this is mostly Robert speaking, the first two bullet points. So this theory has been around since the early 90s. Uh, and like Robert is saying here, it wasn't taken seriously by mainstream macroeconomists uh, at, at, for a while, mostly because there was a little bit of understanding, or, or at least uh, the notion that inflation was mostly under the control of the monetary authority. And this is probably close to the truth for uh, the period from 1980s uh, to 2020. So maybe somebody might argue that maybe the 70s can be interpreted as fiscal inflation. But in recent years, uh, uh, central bankers, economists really thought about uh, inflation as uh, the result of monetary policy actions. Uh, however, the um, post-pandemic inflation uh, associated with this uh, large increase in uh, uh, deficits led uh, some macroeconomists to uh, uh, look a bit more closely at the uh, fiscal theory price level. And uh, uh, one of them is uh, Robert, and that's how we uh, got to work uh, uh, together. Uh, so. So in particular, what we're going to do in this uh, paper is to think about uh, uh, the cross-sectional evidence on 37 OECD countries uh, over the period 2020-2022, so really in the aftermath uh, of the pandemic. Uh, and we are going to, uh, um, as I was mentioning in the beginning, do this uh, through the lens of the fiscal theory price level, but I would say in uh, the bare bone version of the fiscal theory price level. So you will see in a moment, we basically try to uh, 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 be as model free as possible uh, and really think about uh, a frictionless environment with no nominal rigidities. And uh, the idea is that this allows us to uh, get to the essence of the fiscal theory price level, uh, uh, while in some of my previous work, you need to buy perhaps uh, other assumptions uh, with respect to nominal rigidities uh, or other kind of frictions. Um, so. In a, in a nutshell, you can think about the fiscal theory price level uh, as stemming from uh, this uh, government intertemporal budget constraint uh, uh, that is effectively an accounting identity in itself. Uh, the the uh, fiscal theory price level thinks uh, uh, in, a, in a different way how this uh, accounting identity can hold. And so on the left hand side, you have the uh, market value of, uh, uh, of that in real terms. And this has to be equal to the present discounted value of future primary surpluses. Uh, so these uh, movements uh, um, in uh, uh, primary surpluses can uh, potentially lead to movements uh, in prices uh, and uh, in uh, uh, richer versions with the maturity structure can lead to movements uh, in uh, expected inflation. Okay, so as I was saying, uh, so in, in this paper, we try to make a series of simplifying assumptions uh, to get to a very simple uh, econometric uh, exercise. What I would like to emphasize is that there are a series of simplifying assumptions, but qualitatively, uh, you're not losing uh, anything from uh, making these simplifying assumptions. They simply allow you to look at the data in a much simpler way uh, than uh, you would be able to do otherwise. So what are these uh, simplifying assumptions? So, so the first one is that we suppose that there, is a, there are M periods, uh, think about the post-pandemic uh, episode, uh, during which uh, governments spend significantly more than what they would have done otherwise. So think about a pre-pandemic trend that would tell you how much governments typically spend. So we can measure the excess spending 
as a result of uh, uh, the increase uh, in uh, um, spending observed pre and post COVID. Then we assume, and we had, I think, a, a, a long discussion uh, about this yesterday, we assume that uh, the, const the growth rate of the economy is equal to the uh, real interest rate. Again, here what you need is that this is not particularly important for what we are doing. So as long as they are similar, you will get a similar approximation. We are going to assume that in, um, in response to uh, this uh, um, increase in spending, there is the possibility of a temporary increase in inflation over the target, the last capital T periods. And here capital T also coincides with the maturity of outstanding debt. And then finally, we assume a, a particular maturity structure for which uh, uh, nominal payments uh, grow with the, with the economy, with nominal GDP. So if you, if you uh, make these simplifying assumptions, then the nice result is that you get a very simple uh, uh, functional form in which uh, on the left hand side, you have the increase in uh, inflation uh, with respect to the pre-pandemic uh, experience. On the right hand side, you have uh, um, a fairly intimidating uh, term uh, that is uh, the increase in spending divided by the uh, real value of the debt to GDP ratio and the average maturity structure of uh, uh, outstanding debt. So it doesn't take, uh, I guess, uh, much to think why uh, we, uh, the first term is there, why the increase in spending is there. Uh, it, it is a bit, sometimes a bit less intuitive uh, 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 to understand why the uh, real value of debt or the maturity structure uh, should be there. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But so notice that so there's this coefficient eta. So in the, in, in the extreme version, the fiscal theory price level, this uh, coefficient would be equal to one. In the extreme version of Ricardian equivalence, this coefficient would be zero because any change uh, in a spending today is expected to be undone by future changes. So what we are interested in is trying to uh, understand what is uh, the, uh, in the data, at least with respect to the post-pandemic experience, uh, uh, this uh, uh, coefficient theta. So in, as I was mentioning in the beginning, uh, for a long time there was no, the inflation was really perceived as uh, uh, under the control of the monetary authority. Another way to say this uh, is that perhaps during regular times, uh, inflation is not so much related to uh, fluctuations in the present discounted value of spending. And so you might think that what happened with the, with the pandemic uh, is that we had uh, a sort of emergency budget for which there was the understanding that we were not going to increase taxes uh, uh, following this large fiscal stimulus. And so this is uh, related to uh, you know, some, uh, an older literature by uh, Lucas uh, and Stocky, in particular uh, with respect to uh, wartime financing. But more recently, Sargent and his co-authors have a, a paper in which they draw the parallel between uh, uh, the post-World War experience and the post-pandemic experience. They basically do uh, a series of, they, they draw a series of parallels between what happens uh, following uh, a war and what happens uh, uh, following the, and what happened following the uh, pandemic. And more modestly, you know, I, I, I also had done work on, 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 this, uh, uh, in, on, on this topic, showing again that you can think about uh, uh, the post-pandemic inflation as uh, um, the manifestation of uh, an emergency budget, uh, or what we call it in, in our work is uh, an unfunded fiscal shock. But long story short, uh, uh, while during regular times you might think that uh, inflation is uh, perhaps coming from business cycle dynamics uh, uh, or other uh, events, so there might be some uh, key moments in which inflation might actually be really related to expectations about uh, how the government is going to finance a large increase in spending. Okay, so uh, so as I was saying, um, let me explain uh, for a moment why did we have the different terms. Okay, so the first term is the size of the fiscal stimulus itself, and that's exactly what you would expect even uh, beyond the fiscal theory price level. So this idea that uh, if you if you have a larger fiscal stimulus and possibly some nominal rigidities, that might eventually uh, lead uh, to inflation. So what makes uh, uh, this functional form a little bit different from this uh, basic uh, uh, Keynesian uh, uh, thinking 
is the role of the other two terms. So the first one is the amount of outstanding debt. So if you remember, this uh, term enters in the denominator. So what that means uh, is that for a given fiscal stimulus, the larger the amount of outstanding debt, the lower the increase in inflation. So why is that the case? Uh, well, because if you think about inflation as a form of financing, uh, the larger the amount of uh, debt that is uh, currently outstanding, for the same amount of inflation is going to generate more revenues because you are uh, essentially inflating away, roughly speaking, a larger portion uh, of uh, uh, accumulated debt. And for the maturity structure, the maturity structure here plays two roles. Uh, the first one is that if you have an outstanding maturity structure, you can smooth out the increase in inflation because by uh, uh, smoothing out the increase in inflation, long-term nominal interest rates go up, and this devalues the current uh, amount of outstanding uh, debt. And more in general, the longer ma the maturity structure, the, uh, the stronger these uh, um, uh, revaluation effects. And so un unlike what you, you would expect from the simple uh, uh, um, Keynesian uh, intuition, uh, these two terms uh, play an important role uh, in our empirical uh, uh, results. Okay, so the other important uh, uh, um, event that uh, on top of COVID, on top of the fiscal stimulus that occurred over the relevant sample is the uh, Russian aggression of uh, Ukraine. Uh, so we control, uh, we try different things. We try to measure the distance uh, uh, from the border uh, with Russia or Ukraine. We try to uh, control for the trade relations between these countries. But it turns out that the one that seems to work the best, and, and I guess that's a fact of life, is the simplest thing. So to simply have a dummy variable for the countries that are on the border with, uh, uh, with Ukraine or Russia. So in, in our empirical analysis, I'm going to show you two sets of results. Uh, one is, uh, let's say, the basic specification uh, uh, on, based on the relation that I show you. And another one is, uh, is a relation in which we add, uh, it's a regression in which we add a dummy variable if the countries under examination are on the border uh, with Russia or Ukraine. Okay, so the countries that we are looking at are the 37 OECD countries, uh, except for Turkey that, as you probably know, has been all over the place uh, uh, even before COVID and arguably for, for reasons that are not really related to the uh, uh, pandemic. So this gives us uh, 20 countries outside the Eurozone and 17 countries in the Eurozone. So for the Eurozone, I'm going to show you two sets of results. In the first set of results, uh, we're going to treat uh, these uh, 17 countries as a unique uh, economy consistent with the fact that they have uh, one single currency but also consistent with the fact that they are uh, fairly integrated with each other. And then I'm going to show you uh, another set of results in which we also control for the amount of spending that occurred in the different countries. Uh, we are going to look at both headline inflation and uh, core inflation. And uh, as I was saying, we are going to look at with and without this uh, uh, Ukraine-Russia border. And we're going to look at uh, what is interest uh, uh, for us. What is interesting for us is the uh, estimated coefficient uh, eta. You can think uh, as the share of spending that is financed by uh, the surprise uh, in inflation. Okay, so this is uh, our, um, our core results. As I was telling you, the advantage of, uh, of doing a little bit of work ex ante uh, through this uh, series of uh, approximations is that then the econometrics is very easy. So that's a little bit different, uh, as I was saying, from other things I've done in the past in which, uh, you know, you, you, you take the model at face value, but then the econometrics uh, become a, a little bit more complicated. Um, so here, essentially what we are doing, we are uh, regressing the change in inflation post and pre-COVID on the size of the fiscal stimulus rescaled by the amount of outstanding debt and the maturity structure and the average maturity for each country. In the first two columns, you have headline inflation. In the, in the third and fourth, you have core inflation. In column two and, and column four, we control for the border with Ukraine. So what, what the, as, you, as you can tell, these coefficients are all uh, uh, strongly statistically significant. Uh, 
uh, eta that is in the second row, let's focus in the interest of time on the case with the, uh, the uh, Rus with which we control for the Russian border, uh, you can see that uh, the coefficient is uh, statistically significant and around 0.4, it gets a little bit closer to 0.5 when you look at core inflation. And, uh, the, and interestingly, uh, also the, uh, the border dummy is uh, strongly statistically significant. And if you look at the R square in column two and column four, you find an R square that uh, approaches uh, 80%. So that means that a, a, a fairly large fraction of this cross-sectional variation can be explained by the combination between the fiscal stimulus and, and, the, uh, um, and, and the Ukraine Russia conflict. Uh, as you can see, the coefficient on uh, um, uh, our composite government variable uh, government spending variable doesn't change uh, significantly uh, with, with and without uh, the, the, the border, especially if you focus on core inflation. What it does is really is able to explain why a, a, a couple of countries that are uh, on the border with Russia or Ukraine uh, experience significantly more inflation than what can be justified just by looking at their spending. Um, so this is essentially what I, what I just said. Um, so we, as I was saying, we, um, um, we look at uh, both the euro area and uh, the US, and for the euro area, what, uh, uh, what we find is that both measures of inflation and spending are slightly uh, below the United States. Interestingly, both economic areas are very much in line with the, uh, with the rest of the world, they're in the middle of the pack, uh, so to speak, so there are no outliers in any direction. And when you plot uh, uh, um, the, the relation between our composite government spending variable and uh, the change in inflation, you get uh, this uh, very nice relation uh, that doesn't show any particular outliers, again, controlling for the uh, uh, border with the Russia or Ukraine. So you see that all countries line up uh, uh, um, on, on, the di on the diagonal, you see in the middle U Euro and the, and the Euro area and the US, uh, are really like in the middle, both in terms of spending and the inflation experience. Um, so if you do, as I was saying, we, we, we can also do, do this uh, for core CPI and, and, and the results are essentially identical, uh, to, at least visually. So as I, as I mentioned to you, we treat the, the, the Euro area as a unique, um, Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, I was jumping ahead. So as I, so I was mentioning to you, the, the components of our government spending variable are um, all have an, a theoretical interpretation. So there is a reason why they are in there. So something that we try to do is to assess uh, if any of these components is uh, disposable. So in other words, we, we looked at, we took our same model and we restrict, uh, let's say, the maturity structure to be equal to the average. Uh, or the amount of debt to be equal to the average, or the amount of spending to be equal to the average across countries. So as you can imagine, it doesn't take much to guess that uh, uh, restricting the amount of spending uh, is uh, strongly rejected by the data. But what it was interesting for us, and, and to some extent also a little bit surprising, is that uh, even if you try to restrict the amount of debt uh, all the amount of all the maturity structure to be equal to the sample average, the, the, the model is strongly rejected uh, by the data. So what it means is that if you do some kind of model comparison, you would always put uh, something like uh, at least the 99% weight on our baseline model in which uh, government spending is rescaled by maturity and outstanding debt versus the alternative. And uh, if you consider the model in which you simply do not control for any of these two variables, uh, the model doesn't work that well. And uh, we believe this is actually interesting because again, you can think about a new Keynesian story, a Keynesian story in which more spending leads to more inflation, but then there is, uh, that doesn't seem to be working that well. In the sense, if you consider a regression in which you regress the, the change in inflation on the uh, amount of spending across countries, you actually don't get uh, uh, any meaningful uh, results. Okay, so as I was, as I was saying, I, I, I jumped a little bit ahead. For the Eurozone, we also try to see whether uh, uh, the amount of spending in the individual countries uh, was an important determinant uh, of uh, inflation. So we did this in multiple ways, but let me just tell you the one that ma made the cut for the paper. So, um, we have 
our baseline regression, but now with a, a very simple variation. So instead of having one economic area for the whole euro area, we consider all single countries individually. And uh, for these countries, we have the amount of spending for the whole euro area. And then, and you see this uh, in the third row, sorry, I was going to point to it. You see this uh, in the third row for these countries in the euro area, we also control for the difference between the country level spending and the euro area average. So that's the third row in, uh, in this uh, uh, graph. So again, in the interest of time, let's just focus on column two and, and column four. You can see that if we look at headline inflation is mildly statistically significant. If we look at core inflation, that arguably is the cleanest uh, uh, measure when it comes to uh, this idea of uh, uh, spending leading to higher inflation, uh, the reason why I think it's, it's cleaner is because it, you know, it, it, it removes uh, energy prices effectively. You see that these, um, the, the country level amount of spending is not statistically significant. So this is actually important because it's basically saying that um, for the euro area countries, the amount of inflation that they experience is largely determined by uh, the euro area level of spending. And this is, in fact, consistent with the, uh, the idea that uh, you know, the fiscal theory of price level should apply to the whole uh, euro area and not just to single countries. But again, it wasn't obvious to us, uh, and uh, mostly because the, the euro area is not like, as, uh, it's not like, like the United States, in which there is a very well-defined fiscal authority and a very well-defined monetary authority. So we thought that that was interesting. And again, as before, for the euro area, Controlling for the uh, border with Russia and or Ukraine is actually important. Okay, so if you want to visualize this, thank you. If you want to visualize this, uh, uh, so here the, the um, um, orange gold line is uh, our uh, baseline. Uh, so what is the, the what is implied by the uh, um, aggregate level of spending? And so if you if you just control for the a country level of spending, you get the blue line that in the case of uh, um, core inflation is essentially horizontal. Okay, it means that you, you, it doesn't really contribute to explain much of the variation in the euro area levels of inflation. Um, so I'm actually essentially done. So I'm a little bit ahead of time, but nobody ever complained, especially not for the last speaker of the day. Uh, so what, what we did in this paper is to think about uh, the fiscal stimulus implemented in response to uh, the COVID pandemic and, and, and try to uh, think about the inflationary consequences of, of this uh, fiscal stimulus through the lens of the fiscal theory of price level. As I was saying, uh, we, took, uh, uh, we made a series of simplifying assumptions that again, I want to stress out that they don't change anything qualitatively. They just give you a very neat uh, um, empirical relation that you can easily test uh, in the data. And uh, we applied it to uh, OECD countries. So we are currently collecting more data to see uh, if we can uh, um, apply the same uh, exercise to more countries. And what we find is that, we, in fact, there is a strong relation between uh, the amount of spending once corrected for the outstanding debt and the maturity structure and the inflation that these countries uh, 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 experience. Um, the, the other particularly interesting results, so given that I'm at the ECB, is that for the 17 Eurozone countries, uh, uh, it seems that what really uh, matters is the amount of uh, spending for the whole Euro area. Um, what we find is that the coefficient for, uh, for this amount of spending is uh, uh, statistically significant. It's around 40, 50%. So there are two ways to interpret this. The first one is uh, that the remaining part uh, is uh, going to be financed by future increases in taxes. The alternative uh, interpretation is that part of uh, uh, the uh, financing came from a rebound of the real economy, possibly uh, triggered by uh, the amount in spend, the, the increase in spending. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Francesco. So the discussion is uh, Luis Garicano from the LSE. Luis, you have uh, 15 minutes. Thank you. I join uh, Francesco in, in thanking uh, Stefania and Natasha and uh, 
Jacopo and the Mostenes and Bastos and Leopold and Nico for for the organization. It was a great it was a great time, a great conference. Thank you very much. Um, so very fascinating exercise and interesting interesting paper. I really enjoyed uh, I really enjoyed working through it. Uh, let me just start with the, with the most obvious, but just it needs to be said, which is that uh, the fiscal theory of the price level doesn't say that fiscal deficits lead to inflation. Um, so it's something that people tend to think, and they talk about Japan, etc. It's not about that, and that's not indeed what the paper claims. The paper does does a very good job, but I just start with this so that it's clear what it, what the theory says is that fiscal deficits that are unfunded or there is an expectation that are unfunded will not uh, will will lead to inflation. The ones that are not funded by uh, spending cuts, increasing taxes, or lower interest rates. So economic history uh, says that the sergeant's been doing a lot of work on that, or tells us that open happen, happens in wars. It also, um, uh, John Cochrane uh, shows in his, in his book that in normal times, we do see that surpluses usually happen as a correspondence to deficits in normal times. Um, so this distinction between normal times and special times is one that, that Barrow and Bianco, and Bianchi and Francesco leveraged here. And they say, look, um, inflation and fiscal deficits might not be much related to normal economic times, but could be closely collected in, in unusual events, which, which makes a, a lot of sense. There is a, a current QJE uh, paper by, by Marco Bassetto and David Miller, which has these two regimes, an M regime and an F regime, and basically they're arguing, look, in, in the M regime, you're, you're far from the constraint from the moment where people start to panic. So basically, whatever happens with government deficits is not going to have any fiscal consequences. Whereas in moments where you are close to that to that moment when the curve starts shooting up, um, there is going to be uh, information sensitiveness. People are going to be talking about it. They're going to be doing Google searches. They show their increased Google searches. And the risk is going to be uh, that these deficits will show up in, uh, in, in indeed, in, in price raises. Um, so here, uh, what we have is not, I mean, basically the model would give you with, with complete flexible prices a one-off shock uh, in the price, uh, although as, as Angel Luis was, was, was the, use, the, the expression he was using yesterday uh, with me was like what we saw was not an inflation shock, but a price shock. So it's very much what it appears in the theory. Um, in this particular version of the theory, in order to account for the fact that inflation staggered over many, several years, you could think of sticky prices, you could think of, okay, well, we could just think of one period, which is the three years of inflation. Here, what happens is there is long-term debt, so even with flexible prices, you're going to have higher inflation devaluing today's debt and tomorrow's debt, and little by little, I'll show you that later. So they get a very simple equation, and you can think of it as, if you think of just the OLS, as just basically measuring the rise in the price level divided by the by the initial uh, surplus uh, surplus shock is going to give you the fraction of the debt that is uh, not paid by by the sub subsequent surpluses. So it's a nice use of the fiscal theory uh, to understand this this important empirical question. I think it's the right framework because we're talking exactly about this first order prediction of the theory. Um, the findings are consistent with the significant impact of the of the um, COVID uh, shock, and indeed, as you saw, the numbers are 40 to 50 percent unbacked. Um, so the model just just I will not go through the equations. I think uh, Francesco told you what what the basic ideas are. You have basically an equilibrium condition. Um, I'm not going to enter into this this division. If John Cochrane heard uh, the budget constraint, you know he hates that. But uh, I I. I I, 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 this is to the eye of the beholder. Here, uh, we think of an equilibrium condition, the net present value of the government real primary surplus must be enough to finance this stock of, of private debt. So in the right, you have real uh, surpluses. In the left, you have it. I mean, the P is, you could put the P in the, in the, in the right to make, it, to make it nominal. So with no government revenue increase, they're going to just uh, simplify by looking at G. Um, then assume G equals to R and work through uh, in the value of the debt. As Francesco told you, the debt to GDP expected constant, expected inflation is, is pi star, and there's unexpected inflation that devalues the debt. So you just work through that, uh, simplify it, uh, tailor, expand it, get rid of the terms that, that get small, and you get this, this pretty equation, which is the one at the bottom, which says that uh, the net uh, the, the sum of the uh, primary 
deficits over uh, GDP divided by the initial stock of debt uh, is going to be uh, related to the ex excessive inflation. Um, the paper has this 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 kind of extra twist, which is because debt has this maturity structure, the fiscal shock is not going to give you a one-off jump, but it's going to give you jumps over time. Uh, so you're going to have this. This uh, the notation is from from John Cochrane's book. Uh, you're going to have this. This at every maturity, you're going to have some drop uh, in in the in the in the price of the bond that is given by how much the the price uh, level is jumping up. Um, so how is that inflation arrived? Well, the monetary authority is accommodating or generating the chosen time uh, path level of inflation. Um, so uh, they're going to take it to the data. This is the formula. Uh, the inflation rate reacts to the community search. I think everybody sees that from the formula. There's a slope that measures the amount of unfunded debt and, and probably should be part of the model from the start, uh, if, if possible. Uh, so there's the hypothesis which you can test that this time is different. Uh, you could have the eta equals zero and then everything is as, as usual, or you could have a positive eta which tells you we're in a war pandemic situation. The inflation increases larger, the bigger baseline of debt to GDP. Um, Francesco pointed this out. I'll talk briefly in my comments. And um, the debt maturity, this is more straightforward, so I won't discuss that. Debt maturity is going to mean that the higher debt maturity with a little increase in inflation, you're going to soak up more of the debt, get rid of more of the debt with, with, with less inflation. So that's actually giving you um, lower inflation rates with the same G. So the empirical strategy, the authors called old school econometrics, which I like because I'm old school. Um, uh, so so uh, they just have the, the inflation differential regress. I mean, you could just see the paper as, hey, what's the correlation between these two things and to what extent the excess government spent to GDP uh, correlates with those inflations across those OCD countries. So three three comments, the supply shock interpretation, the initial debt in the denominator, and the Eurozone. I, I will talk a little bit about the uh, monetary fiscal interactions in the monetary union, the, the fiscal implications and so on. So on the supply shock interpretation, the authors argue that uh, what you need for identification across var country variation uh, can be treated as exogenous. So, so the question is whether this could be also consistent with inflation coming with the supply shock. And think of, 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 of Olivia's example yesterday from an energy price. So you have an energy price increase, uh, higher energy prices. What are we going to do? I mean, we could just say, okay, we're going to get the price level back to where it was. So that means everything else has to have lower prices. The central bank says, well, there's sticky prices, so that's just too hard. So it chooses a higher overall price level, and then the supply shock spreads. There's nothing nefarious, it's just that the, the, the bank is not uh, is not targeting in price levels. It's targeting inflation, and once things have happened, well, bygones are bygones and so on. So um, is this really, really that different? Okay, so, so think through it. So uh, the key claim, I think, and I put this on the table for Francesco and, 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 and you all to, to discuss, but it seems to me that the point estimate that 40, 50% of the extra spending was financed through inflation, that seems to be um, still true. I mean, what's going to happen is you're going to have this precisely because the bank is just doing its job and saying, okay, well, this stuff happened, but inflation is just whatever it is. Uh, it's, we're looking forward and not backwards, then this 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 result is still still going to be true. So so I think that it doesn't really, really matter, but but I, I, I raise this, this issue. Second, the debt in the denominator, the authors say, hey, look, this is less intuitive. Francesco explained it, I think, very clearly, so I don't want to say much, uh, much, much about it. The, 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 the result follows simply from, if you have a lot of debt with, uh, I think Francesco said it better than I'm going to say it. So if you have a lot of debt, just a tiny bit of extra inflation, is going to wipe out sufficient debt to pay for all that extra G, basically. Um, third, uh, the Eurozone um, and the uh, uh, European story. There is wide variation across countries in inflation rates. Part of it is the, the, the Baltics and the, and the Ukraine crisis getting different. Um, but it's clear, so these are these kind of supply and political issues in part, but it's also clear as, as, as Francesco showed you, that the overall uh, level matters. Uh, 
and I wanted to 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 spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about what are the fiscal theory implications in terms of the of the eurozone uh, or the fiscal monetary implications, uh, or at least to open some questions for for discussion. Um, so. I'm um, working on this on this uh, book with with John and with Klaus on my right. Um, we are uh, still kind of uh, working through it. I think it's it's in a, in a relatively advanced stage, but there's still work to do. Um, and and basically, what we are what we are starting from is is something that you probably saw in my in my question yesterday and some of the interventions by other people in the panel, which is this this sense that this bizarre sense, right, that Europe is getting more intergovernmental. Uh, so, so think about, I mean, you're going to be shocked by what I just said, right? But think about from the expenditure side, um, people are talking about the need for a public, for a budget, from, for some public goods funded from the center, from the revenue sa side, we're talking about own resources. Well, the own resource discussion is going nowhere. Um, the parliament tried to get these own resources on the table in, 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 in the government, the countries are totally against the public goods, uh, finance, public goods, uh, we tried that with the next gen. I mean, it was in next round, it was getting smaller at the end. There are no public goods with next gen, all the money so checks for the countries. So uh, the idea is, I mean, to some extent, what we are seeing is like, okay, there's only one European institution, which is this one, where we are sitting right now, the European Central Bank. And it's kind of by necessity, by obligation, I'm not saying by choice, it's just basically taking out all these other functions, this lender of last resort, lender of first resort, lender of second resort, all the other resorts, um, both in the interbank market and the, in the in the in the in the in the lending to governments in in, 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 in the in the past, in the in the recent past. And also with this some of these instruments that we were discussing, like TPI, what you see is that there is an extent to which, and I don't want to exaggerate this, uh, to which this insurance is creating the following type of moral hazard. Countries and European Council as a whole don't need to do things because, hey, we already have common debt, which is reserves and the ECB doing its job. So think of the ESM ratification by Italy. Italy refuses to ratify the ESM. Would it refuse if the ESM was behind? I mean, it's, the ECB was not behind. I mean, the ESM is a good thing for Italy, but they prefer to just kind of avoid, have a credible threat and, and avoid this. Banking Union. Basically, the Banking Union was dropped exactly. Uh, the Banking Union um, uh, roadmap was, was, was dropped at the same time as the TPI announcement. So, so there is here a problem, which is like, and the sovereign exposures problem keeps being there. So, so we are discussing the extent to which um, uh, the, uh, the institutions governing the euro change over time, as the as the ECB kind of took all these other other functions and the fiscal rules became less and less credible. Uh, the, there is now, we believe, a, a, a bit of a fragility with these very large sovereign fundings and this long term situation. With this, in the long term, the, the ECB has this gigantic balance sheet. I don't think there is a very clear sense that this is going to be reduced. You could say, uh, oh, well, Japan has the same situation, so who cares? Uh, I think it's, there, there are differences here, as we discussed, in the terms in terms that we need incentives for the construction of Europe that now don't seem to exist. And, and we believe that institutional changes are absolutely urgent to ensure that the euro area is prepared for future adverse shocks. And right now, uh, I honestly, like, I've been on the inside. As some of you know, I've, I've been doing politics for a while. I'm now back to academia. but. But but I, from the inside, you don't see any movements on any of these topics. Um, going back to the paper, path breaking, path breaking work, taking fiscal theory to the data, uh, a really nice parsimonious explanation and very uh, important implications for policy. So congratulations to Francesco. And I have 45 seconds left, so I think I was. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, uh, Luis and Francesco. Let's. Uh... Do the same as before. Let's open the, the floor for some questions. Ettore, Lucio. First of all, just a, a quick reaction to, to Luis. If DCB is a central bank without a state, uh, the problem is not with DCB. The problem is with the lack of the state. But, uh, but um, uh, so uh, regarding um, this very interesting paper, uh, um, you uh, rightly move from this uh, state contingent nature uh, 
of public finance, and you rightly assume an ETA above zero um, under exceptional circumstances, you know, such as uh, a pandemic uh, or a war. Uh, at the same time, state contingency uh, also means that uh, uh, fiscal policy can respond differently to different shocks. You know, I know that the US is pretty different from, from, from the Euro area, but uh, here in the Euro area, we had two fundamentally different states of the economy during the period that you are considering, 2020-22. Um, we had in 2020-21 a phase that um, basically was of a divine coincidence. Uh, but then uh, in 2022, in the presence of uh, a strong uh, uh, external supply shock, uh, uh, we had uh, monetary policy tightening coupled with a new generation of fiscal measures, you know, un unconventional fiscal policies. So actually, uh, if you look at the COVID-related measures already in 22, on the, in the aggregate, there was a rolling back of, of these measures. What kicked in where uh, these new measures such as, you know, um, uh, gas and electricity price breaks, energy uh, VAT cuts, which were deliberately by very construction designed to lower uh, inflation. And in the short run, they succeeded. Although, of course, in the longer run, uh, the jury's out whether this is mere inflation uh, smoothing or uh, uh, really can have an effect. But so my, my point is that um, state dependency may matter not only for, for ETA, but also for the type and, and the composition of fiscal policies, more traditional measures you know, with um, aggregate demand effects or uh, unconventional fiscal policies. Uh, so does this matter, should that be taken into account? This is my question. Yeah. Uh... To question one very specific one uh, uh, broader. The very specific question uh, is linked to the revenue component of the reaction, because as Luis was uh, showing in the in the in the in one of his slides, it assumes that revenue do not play a role, and you have just expenditure in your estimate. Still, I guess country may have differed in the extent to which they acted on the revenue side. So I'm wondering why you are not taking into account, perhaps because it's difficult to discriminate between the overall response of revenue and discretionary revenue measure, the discussion that we had also yesterday. So that is the, is the specific question. The broad question, again, suggested, I mean, by listening to the discussion by Luis, uh, is about the euro area. I mean, and the fact that you showed that in the case of the euro area, the effect is, is not differentiated. Now, in the pandemic, we also had the fact that the increase in deficit was all finance or over finance in some cases by uh, purchases uh, uh, of, of bonds by the, by the ECB. Uh, okay, I don't think this is captured in, in your very, very simple, uh, uh, very simple specification, but I wonder whether you could elaborate whether this uh, may have a, a bearing on on, on, on your result. Yeah, first, uh, well, thanks, Francesco, for this uh, very, very interesting work. And uh, I have a question about interpretation, but I think it's important. That is, uh, um, you uh, find uh, a positive value of ETA, and uh, throughout, uh, you have emphasized how this is consistent with the fiscal theory of the price level. But at least uh, from a theoretical point of view, I view it consistent also with uh, a world where the central bank is active. It uh, tries to stabilize inflation, even not fully, as for instance, we have seen uh, yesterday in, in the paper by, by, Christian, uh, by Christian. We can even have a central bank that keeps the real interest rate constant, but generates inflation. And, uh, but you know, this is not related to the fiscal theory of the price level. So I would like to hear your thoughts uh, about this. Thank you, Davide. Uh, yes, Klaus, please. Very short question. Many of you know in the ECB that I'm a big fan of the work of uh, Francesco. Um, 
And I, I find it really interesting, this emergency case, which you now with, with Robert Bell discusses, hmm, that there is an emergency, and then it doesn't depend whether you have a high or a debt, a low debt level to start with. Almost everybody uses some inflation, and even those with a very low debt level, much higher inflation, to get the same relief. And how does this, Francesco, contrast with, with the other work you're doing where, say, the fiscal limit uh, paper you, you presented at Jackson Hole, where I always got the impression whether the fiscal theory kicks in with the deficits creating inflation is always when you are at the limit, when the fiscal authority has so much debt and so high taxes that they cannot further increase taxes credibly after a shock. So, where, where if that is true, or say outside a broad emergency like a war or a pandemic, then it would more depend on this country-specific uh, kind of constraints on future fiscal policy. How, how do you see that? If I may add my own uh, five cents following up uh, the comments by David and, and, and Lucho, I mean, I guess that in the euro area we can distinguish uh, two different periods after the COVID. The initial one was uh, one with uh, a very large fiscal response by uh, national authorities, by all the governments of the of the euro, that, uh, however, came uh, with falling inflation and falling inflation expectations. Don't forget that. I mean, at the beginning, our challenge was to reflate the economy because the, the shock uh, was initially uh, strongly disinflationary, also with a negative impact on long term inflation expectations. So. I'm not sure that, uh, of course, this is very uh, informal, no, but I'm not sure that uh, the mechanics of the fiscal theory of the price level applied to this very initial stage. No? The second stage was one of uh, sustained uh, inflation, which is, it can be argued that is lasting until until now. No? But uh, here, I, I mean, as far as I remember, the fiscal theory of the price level tells you something about the connection between uh, fiscal uh, policy and deficits and the price level, not about inflation. In order to generate sustained high inflation, you probably need sustained surprises on the fiscal variables, right? Because in expectation, even in a, in a non-Ricardian fiscal theory price level regime, expected inflation is still controlled by the, by the, by the central bank, right? So in your view, how we, sh how we should think about uh, uh, the fiscal theory in order to account for these two different uh, stages in the in the crisis here in the euro area. So with this, give me uh, I, I'll give the floor to Francesco and uh, we may pick up a second. OK, so let, let, let me first uh, uh, thank thank uh, uh, Luis for the uh, great discussion, also for broadening a little bit uh, the perspective, like mentioning his uh, uh, his work. Uh, uh, so let me start from the end. I always find it easier because I remember the question uh, very well. So yeah, the, the very first version of the of the fiscal theory of price level uh, uh, was about uh, uh, price level determination. Then since then, uh, and, and John's book I think summarizes this very well. Uh, things have uh, evolved quite a bit. So the first thing that was done is like, well, if you have a maturity structure what uh, uh, stabilized debt uh, is also expected inflation because it gives you revaluation effects. Then people started working with, on nominal rigidities and I, I did a lot of work with that. Uh, and, and there you have that even without a maturity structure, inflation has its own persistence. Uh, and, and so there is this interplay between the nominal rigidities and the fiscal theory of price level. But um, even without going there, and, and Robert, prefers not to go there because he's not a big fan of nominal rigidities, uh, you can really think that if there is a maturity structure, there is an interest uh, of uh, policymakers to reflate the economy, like very much like you were mentioning, because that devalues the, the, the um, value of outstanding debt. Uh, so Klaus made a, a great point. Uh, so he, so he, this, it's a bit subtle. Um, uh, the role of debt, uh, because th th it has two roles for for the conditional on a certain amount of unfunded spending, larger debt lowers inflation. There is a different question, it's like how likely are you to engage in unfunded spending? And that might be the other way around. If you already have a large amount of debt, you might be more tempted to uh, go with an unfunded level of spending. Now, the reality of this, uh, and you know, this is something I learned by working uh, on US data, the reality of this is that typically high fiscal inflation is associated with low debt, uh, it's almost like the high inflation and low debt are ju just the other two sides of the coin. In a sense, if a country is allowed to drive up his debt to GDP ratio without massive inflation, it's because 
for one reason or the other, maybe because it's part of a, of a, of a currency union, there is the expectation that somehow we'll be able to sustain it, okay? Uh, but yeah, but, the, but if, you are, if you are like, okay, we are in a dare situation, we are more likely in engaging in a, in a funded debt because we, we, in a funded spending because we have already a large stack of debt, that, that's definitely uh, co consistent. I think COVID is a little bit of a particular case uh, in which no matter where, what your starting position was, uh, there, uh, there was some justification in uh, um, uh, using unfunded spending, also in light of the fact that monetary policy was constrained by the low interest rate environment. So Davide made another good point. So I, I discussed uh, uh, Chris' paper, so I know him very well. Like, I think like in, like, in all, like in all models, I think you, you, you need to buy something. So in, 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 uh, um, in uh, increased work with uh, Marius and Chen, you need to buy a bounded rationality of a particular form. You need to buy the fact that nobody uh, internalizes uh, the uh, long-term uh, um, low motion of the debt to GDP ratio, okay? So, um, so Lucio, um, yeah, so, we don't talk about, we talk about revenues in the paper. We basically say that revenues did not change much. They mostly, the, the, la, the large variation in primary surpluses was mostly coming from spending, at least for the window of time uh, that we look at. Now we know that uh, given that because of tax brackets, uh, uh, some, uh, uh, some people have moved up in the tax brackets. And so that has generated a, a, a mild increase in revenues just coming from the, uh, um, the um, higher inflation. But again, if you think about the fiscal stimulus for us, in the data, it seems to be the cross variation seems mostly coming from different levels of spending. Um, uh, with respect to the ECB buying uh, government bonds, well, if you think that eventually these bonds will have to return to the market, it's still an increase uh, in uh, outstanding uh, debt. Um, and unless you think that the ECB is uh, literally going to eventually monetize it, but and that's inflationary in itself. Um, I, I totally agree that it's important to think about, uh, that's a rhetoric point, it's important to think about how exactly you implement uh, spending. Uh, as I was saying, we, we, we take a very kind of high level approach here. Then of course, uh, uh, you know, for, for policy purposes, for policy advice, yes, it's also important to understand how um, uh, you spend the money and it's possible that the error term that we don't have a 100% uh, R square. So it's possible that what explains the, that error term is, um, well, not all spending is uh, the same. Um, I think I'm, I'm done. I, I mean, I don't think I had to add much to what Luis said. I think these were more like uh, uh, kind of constructive comments. There is nothing uh, I particularly disagree with, uh, and I agree that uh, John really hates uh, that uh, this uh, government budget constraint uh, uh, thing. He emailed us saying that we shouldn't use it, but yeah. We had at least one remaining question by Ramon. Ramon, please. I just have a final uh, question. It's almost more for Luis. Whether you think that now that is more this intergovernmental mood, we are very lucky because if they had postponed 10, 15 more years, the Pierre Werner report, we will not be here. Uh, that's a philosophical question. I guess it goes with the, with the, uh, so my reflections went with the title of the session. So I hope this, this goes as well. I mean, if you think about it, uh, Ramon, I mean, I'm sure you've thought about it. I mean, the rule-based trade order, right? The Washington consensus, that's the nineties. We have some good rules and we try all to behave well. Uh, the euro is a child of this consensus, right? It's free capital mobility, it's a rule, it's an independent central bank. We are going to tie our hands. We're going to not do bad things on budgets. It's kind of a son or a daughter of, of uh, Lucas, Stocky, Prescott, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, so am I, it's now 30 years since I, since I took my first micro class in Chicago. Um, but but all that is kind of uh, the rule-based world order and intellectual construct behind the Washington Consensus is kind of uh, being uh, kind of questioned everywhere. And in some sense, the European Union, the limitation of state aids, the limitation on on what what the governments can do to help their companies, 
all of those things, we have a single market, we are all fulfilling the rules, outside of Europe are being put in question. And in some sense, it's inevitable that inside, in Euro inside of Europe, uh, all of those institutions are kind of, uh, I don't know, we are, I mean, in some sense, I mean, think of the single market and state aid rules, they are being obviously in question. And, and, and yes, I would think the Bernard report wouldn't happen today. I would agree with that. 